Hi, welcome. I'm Dr. Gonzalez and today in this video we're going to talk about... Let's talk about the heart. First of all, the purpose of the heart is to pump blood. Uh, a couple of facts about the heart is that it beats about 100,000 100, times per day and it pumps approximately 2.9 gallons of blood per minute. That is basically two gallons of milk, if you imagine. That's amazing. An overview of the cardiovascular system, specifically of the heart, is that the, ha the heart is about the size of a clenched fist. And the heart consists of four chambers. You're gonna have right atrium, right ventricle, and then on the left side, a left atrium and a left ventricle. The heart also pumps blood into two circuits, a pulmonary and a systemic system. Also, don't forget that the heart has a pericardium, which is the serous membrane that protects the heart on the outside. And if you look at the layers of the heart, it has three layers, an epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium. But the myocardium, remember, is the middle layer, and it's actually that muscle that contracts. This muscle, remember, it has intercalated discs that create a direct electrical connection, and it makes it contract as one unit. If we divide the heart into two sides, remember that the right side is mostly for deoxygenated blood, and the left side is mostly for oxygenated blood, although we refer as deoxy and oxy, right? But in reality, most of the blood, it's going to be, for example, deoxygenated, meaning that it has high concentrations of CO2, but it can still have a little bit of concentration of oxygen. The same on the oxygenated side. It will have high concentrations of oxygen, but it can still have a little bit of uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide. Now let's take a look at the internal anatomy of the heart. One of the things that we need to look at is the valves. So the first thing is that we have two types of, of valves. One, it's called the AV valves or atrioventricular valves because it means that they are located in between atrium and ventricle. For example, we got the tricuspid tricuspid valve, which is right here in between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And then we have the bicuspid, also known as mitral. And this one is located in between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Meanwhile, we also have the semilunar valves in between the ventricles and the big blood vessels. For example, we have the pulmonary, pulmonary valve, and we have the aortic. The pulmonary valve is going to be in between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. The aortic valve is going to be in between the left ventricle and the aorta. Now let's go ahead and trace a red blood cell through the heart. We're going to begin on the right side. Remember that deoxygenated blood comes from the body to the either the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. So that's going to be your first step. Second step is going to be from uh, your right atrium to the right ventricle so that the oxygenated blood empties into the right ventricle. Then it's gonna move into the pulmonary trunk and then to the pulmonary arteries. And then it goes into the lungs. In the lungs, there's gonna be gas exchange and we're gonna have, for example, oxygen coming in and the CO2 going out. So once the blood is oxygenated in the lung, it comes back to the heart, and this oxygenated blood enters the left atrium, 
via the pulmonary veins. In here, once it's filled, it goes and it crosses to the left ventricle. That's step number six. And then the last step is from the left ventricle to the aorta and then into the body. So the cardiac cycle essentially consists of alternate periods of contraction and relaxation. Contraction is typically known as systole. Meanwhile, relaxation is typically known as diastole. So going back to systole, systole is made up of atrial systole, which means both atriums are contracting. And then there's also ventricular systole, which means both ventricles are contracting. Then during diastole, it's the contrary, remember, means relaxation. So in this case, whether it is atrial diastole or ventricular diastole, in here the chambers are filling with blood because they are being relaxed. There are going to be two kinds of cells. We're going to have the nodal cells located in the sinoatrial node, or SA node for short, and the atrioventricular node, or AV node. So in this case, the rate of contraction is going to be established by these cells because they automatically, automatically depolarize by creating something that we call autorhythmicity, which means that your heart can beat by itself. So the sonoatrial node, it's going to be located in the posterior wall of the right atrium, close or proximal to the superior vena cava. And then the other pacemaker, the atrioventricular node, sits within the floor of the right atrium. So here and here. The sinoatrial node is also referred as to the cardiac pacemaker uh, because these pacemaker cells in the SA node automatically generate 80 to 100 action potentials per minute. And so this is where um, other terms such as bradi bradycardia and tachycardia come from, right? Because bradycardia, you know, is uh, slower than normal heart rate. Meanwhile, tachycardia is a faster than normal heart rate. Some additional components of the conductive system besides the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node it's going to be the AV bundle which conducts the impulse from the AV node to the bundle branches. So that's going to be located in this area right here. And then we're going to have left bundle branch and right bundle branch. These are located in the interventricular septum. And they also communicate with the moderator band. The moderator band basically replaces the stimulus through the ventricle to the papillary muscles. And then these are going to help tense the cord tendina before the ventricles contract. In the case of the left and right uh, bundle branch, they're going to extend towards the apex of the heart. And then these, it's going to radiate across the inner surface of the left ventricle and right ventricle. And then right here, we're going to have these Purkinje fibers that basically they will be conveying the impulses very rapidly uh, to the contractile cells of the ventricular uh, myocardium. Last but not least, let's discuss a few additional information, which is the autonomic control of the heart rate. Remember that in your brain, particularly in the medulla oblongata, it's 
is where we have the cardiac centers that modify the heart rate. So for example, we're gonna have stimulation of the um, cardio -accelerator acceleratory center, which essentially activates sympathetic neurons. Remember, sympathetic is the fight or fly. And this is gonna increase the heart rate. Meanwhile, the stimulation of the cardioinhibitory centers uh, is going to activate the parasympathetic, which is also known as the rest or digest. And this is going to involve the vagus nerve to decrease the heart rate. And so some of the um, chemicals involved in the autonomic control of, of the heart rate is going to be uh, norepinephrine and also we're going to have acetylcholine. So norepinephrine, for example, uh, it's part of your sympathetic division and it's going to cause the actual increase in the heart rate and it's going to increase the force of contractions. In the case of acetylcholine, uh, this comes from the parasympathetic system and it's going to cause a decrease in the actual heart rate and a decrease in the force of contraction. And that's it for today. Hey, thank you for watching one more time. And if you like this shirt, it's now available on my Etsy shop. Thank you. See you next time.